Welcome to Untold Stories of Innovation, where we amplify untold stories of insight, impact, and innovation. Powered by Untold Content, I'm your host, Katie Trout taylor Our guest today is Chelsea Walter. She is executive director and founder at Women of Cincy. Chelsea, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm a huge fan of Women of Cincy. Obviously, the context here is that Chelsea and I have been friends for several years as we both formed startups in the Cincinnati region. Uh, For Chelsea, it was Women of Cincy, and for me, it was Untold. And both of us obviously have a passion and a love for storytelling, which we will definitely get into in our conversation. But tell us about Women of Cincy, Chelsea. Yeah, I'd love to. And thanks for having me, by the way. I'm really excited. Yeah, I had to have you on the podcast. Again, Soul Sisters in Innovation and Storytelling. So uh, so this is going to, we're probably going to geek out a lot on this episode. I really appreciate it. I hope to do it justice. So Women of Cincy has been around for about three years now. Um, and we are a nonprofit media platform built to awaken and amplify change makers through storytelling, community, and mentorship. So those are the three buckets that we operate under. And so basically we believe that citizens have the power to create a more equitable, inclusive city. But really that starts with taking control of our narrative and our collective story and understanding and respecting one another on a deeper level because that's how we problem solve, that's how we move forward and that's just how we create stronger communities. I love your mission and and your origin story as well. Can you tell us, you know, I'm very familiar. I think a lot of listeners might be already familiar with Women of Cincy, but tell us sort of the types of storytelling that you do. It's all across the map. Um, One kind of cool feature about how Women of Cincy is organized is that all of our feature stories are 100% nominations. So it's 100% community driven. So you can go onto our site right now if you want to and nominate somebody, womenofcincy.org slash nominate. And because they're all nomination based, it means that our storytelling is just a super wide scope. So we'll interview anybody from um, stay-at-home moms, nurses, teachers, women who own multi-million dollar companies, women who are experiencing housing insecurity, uh, female filmmakers, female entrepreneurs, not even always all women. Um, We're very open about who we tell stories about. We tell everybody's story. um, So you don't have to just identify as a woman. But yes, our storytelling really hopefully reflects uh, Cincinnati itself and all the people who are living in we want to thrive in it. I've learned about just the incredible diversity of women or women identifying people in the Cincinnati region through all of your organization's efforts. And I think so many of us can say that, that um, that we've been sort of changed by seeing and experiencing the lives of, of other women who have been featured on your site. Tell us about some of your, I, I know it's like picking a, a favorite child, so I don't mean to ask you to choose a favorite story, but tell us about some of the stories stories that that have really touched you that have been kind of memorable um, or or that you've heard a lot of um, feedback in the community about? So I would say off the top of my head, a couple come to mind. Monique Gilliam's story is amazing. She's been through all kinds of stuff and the amount of just resiliency that that woman has just is mind-blowing. So I definitely recommend uh, Monique's story. Tell, Tell us more about it. Yeah, so uh, Monique Gilliam, she works with families. um, I think it's the Family Independence Initiative. So she she helps families figure out how to um, kind of budget money and also set their personal goals and just figure out how to move forward as a family. And so her stories around that are pretty cool. She's also had to deal with quite a few just deaths and setbacks and some struggles with housing and just so many issues that she's been thrown (laughs) thrown into and she's just come out on the other end um, and she's always just got this like fantastic huge smile on her face one of the most encouraging uplifting people i've ever met in my life so monique is a really great one uh lauren elise is a singer songwriter same thing she's just always just um pouring into other people um and she's been through a lot of ups and downs in her life and she's always come out of it on the other end um our housing and security series just completely changed who I am just like fundamentally as a person um the just awareness that I necessarily didn't have going into it about what some folks in our community are experiencing um which is mind-blowing and all the strength of the people in that series showed me our theme entrepreneurship series um another one just seeing people go through so much and come out on the other end is just really inspiring and 
kind of helps you figure out what your own roadmap is for things that you want out of life is seeing how other people did it first. I could talk all day. <laughs> <laughs> yes. No, I love it. And, and in the early days, I think the idea was get, get the stories out there. And then as you kept growing and maturing, you started creating series as well to tackle different topics. So you mentioned housing insecurity and entrepreneurship and sort of different series that would help uh, kind of align certain stories to help reveal a problem or or a part of our region's identity and, and how that's getting lived out in the lives of individual people. Uh, and I love that. Tell us a little bit more about some of the housing insecurity challenges that were revealed as as part of your storytelling efforts? So a lot of it is just um, a lack of affordable housing. Um, Cincinnati, according to, um, I think it was a list study, is 40,000 units short of affordable housing. And I have experienced that myself, having issues just finding places that I can afford the rent on that are also safe <laughs> um, and well-kept and just, I don't know, a place you can actually build a home in because a shelter is not a home. That's another thing that I think was a big takeaway is just because you have a roof over your head doesn't mean that you necessarily have a home that you can come in, come home and just thrive in um, and let your guard down and just feel safe. So that was a big one. Um, wages. Most of the people that we talked to who are experiencing housing insecurity were working and they were working 40 hours a week or they were almost working 40 hours a week, but not quite getting there because their employers, you know, benefits come with full-time work. So they're being limited a certain amount of hours. So a lot of people have multiple jobs. Um, child care was through the roof um, cost-wise for some people. And a lot of folks that we talked to, um, just, it was a perpetual cycle. So, you know, their parents had gone through similar things and their aunts and uncles. And um, it's just, it's something that's really hard to break. I don't think that... Um, the idea of the American dream is really nice, but um, I don't necessarily think that the systems that we have set up allow everybody equal access to that. Yeah, definitely. And something that's so powerful about Women of Cincy is in recent months, you've uh, transformed into a nonprofit organization. And could you tell us a little bit about how the storytelling and the story sharing that you're doing is creating conversation in our community and perhaps opening new doors? Or, or obviously at the individual level, that's true, right? We're, we're reading each other's stories. But what about at the you know city level government involvement or uh, involvement with other nonprofits or other investment groups, how how has the response been um, in terms of how these stories are shaping the way that our entire city views the issues impacting our citizens? We're finding out all the time because um, we don't always know, you know, once you put a story out there, what the ripple effect is. Um, so like, for instance, the other day I was... Um, having drinks with some friends and a friend of a friend was there and she's in a larger organization and um, they were looking for some support around teen pregnancy. And so they had actually, one of the women there had read a story on our site. They connected with another small organization and they all started working together. So that was a really cool story that I didn't even know was happening of somebody reading something on our site, figuring out a way to connect and meet more needs that wasn't necessarily there in the first place. I've also seen just a lot of political will being built up around some of these issues like housing, like female entrepreneurship. Um, the series themselves are just being brought up in a lot of rooms that everybody doesn't always have access to. And so it's kind of a cool way for, you know, us like everyday people, I guess, to influence what's happening in our city. Um, so we hear all kinds of like ways that our stories are trickling down, but we're always learning. And I think that, uh, so for context, COVID-19 is happening right now. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But we're recording this. Um, I'm in a coat closet. Yeah. And Chelsea, you're at home. So we're, we're doing this via Zoom. It's a little unusual. Normally we would be in the lovely Gwyn Sound Studios. <laughs> that's all right. We're all flexible. Yes, that's right. We're doing our responsible social distancing right now. Right. But yeah, so like even with all of this stuff happening, we're even seeing the way that, um, we're being pulled into a lot of conversations to figure out how to build community with a lot of the folks that we're connected to or how to get not physical resources to people, but to aggregate all the different people that we know into a, a reliable, organized platform. So we're constantly changing um, all the time and trying to just 
mold and move in whatever way we need to to meet needs that we are seeing with our community. It's always different. I never exactly know how we're directly impacting um, larger conversations, but I hear lots of commentary about how we're doing it. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that that's true. And what I love, again, to me, Women of Cincy is critical to the the innovation ecosystem in Cincinnati. And I don't only mean that in terms of a lot of the success our region is seeing in, in tech startups and, and, and being able to make entrepreneurship something that the everyday person feels empowered to try. Um, the impact that I think Women of Cincy is having, it's not it's not only about creating conversations and um, and helping us understand one another. It's like you mentioned, it's about also empowering others to see, oh, this particular person tried out this big idea and it worked. Or this person ran their idea by a certain group of people and found community in that and sparked up something new, whether that was a new solution to a, an existing societal problem or whether that was an, a business idea. And so I just, I see the work that you're doing at Women of Cincy is so critical to uh, everything about our, our community and our economic development, but also especially to the innovation ecosystem here in our region. And you've been able to elevate the stories of entrepreneurs and and small business owners and, uh, and, and tech startup builders as well in, in a way that really helps us understand who each other are. And I really believe that like the whole, it's the whole see it, be it kind of mentality. Sometimes it's hard to picture yourself um, in a certain position or in a certain career if you don't see other people out there doing it and succeeding who look like you, um, who are in your same situation, who you can relate to. So I think there's just a ton of power in just seeing it happen. And then you're like, well, maybe I can do it too. And from a personal standpoint, if Women of Cincy didn't have all of these like powerful inspirational stories like coming in that I'm just like living in every day. I mean, there's no way in hell I could keep up with all of this or have the energy to do it or to go through all the things that it takes to run something like this because it is really hard. But every day I'm just surrounded by people who are just out there doing it. So it's like, why, why can't I do it too? Yeah, I, I think that's the power of, of sharing our stories, whether we're doing it at a regional level, the way that, that your organization is, or whether we're trying to do that inside of our companies that we're, that we're in. And there's something else, too, that I think uh, I've had the good fortune of being on the interviewee side. Something that I remember taking away from, I think it was the first interview we did with you, which is like two years ago. I don't even know. We had just started uh, women of Cincy and we're still trying to figure out what all of it was. I was just absolutely amazed about how you built untold while building your family at the same time. And just like the way that you figured that out and structured it. Um, I just remember just being like, Hey, maybe I can do this too. Cause I think that children terrify me, <laughs> the idea of it. <laughs> But I remember like hearing you talk about it. I'm like, well, I mean, if Kitty can do it, maybe Daddy. I can do it too. And there's my son. <laughs> and there's my son. Wow. This is, uh, hang on. Just a second. <laughs> how, how do we balance work and family life, guys? How do we do that? <laughs> and we're back. <laughs> and we're back. Yeah. Thank you for saying that. I think it, it, it's really important to me that we do share stories of how we survive in our multiple roles, whether we have kids or we have parents that we're caring for, or we're trying to get through school while also start a company. You know, it, I think entrepreneurship can look like a lot of different things, and we need to keep celebrating that and bringing awareness to it. So, thank you for saying that about you know, feeling like you could do it because you saw me do it. And I'm thinking now of all the millions of other women who I saw, especially I'm thinking of um, one of my favorite mentors who had four children and also was a research professor. And she just balanced it so beautifully and also mentored people like myself in, in the midst of all of that. So yeah, being willing and and open about sharing what's working and what's not working. I, I think in that first interview, I think I talked about like breastfeeding, breast pumping rather in my car, like on the way to client meetings, just trying to make it work and trying to make the hustle work as a new mom is really challenging. Yeah. And that's the kind of stuff that I think um, is necessary because if we keep not talking about all the aspects of our journey, um, 
we're not we're not gonna convince anybody that like it's possible because i think that people can smell bullshit a mile away <laughs> you know i mean they know if you like talk about this yeah. like oh it's little, so easy serendipitous journey and it's and yeah like things just fell into place and all of a sudden someone showed up with some vc funding and whatever. I'm like, that's not what life looks like. Yeah. And it's certainly not what entrepreneurship tends to look like. You know, but most, <laughs> oh, of, no. most of our friends who are in the startup space, right? We talk a lot about how it's an emotional roller coaster. And it's funny, there's this juxtaposition. People talk a lot about the freedom that comes with entrepreneurship. <laughs> and we're both, we're on video chat right now. So you can't, you can't see that we're smiling and, and sort of laughing at that because uh, with with great freedom comes great responsibility. Yeah. And, um, and and anyone listening who has been a startup founder understands that on a deep level, I think. Uh-huh, for sure. I mean, I may be able to, you know, go grab ice cream in the middle of the day. I don't actually go grab ice cream in the middle of the day, but... None of us do. But we, if we wanted to, we could. <laughs> yeah, but like also at, you know, 12 o'clock at night when there's like something wrong with a story, who's... who's um who's on the line, right? Like I'm the last line of defense. So I'm the one that's got to roll out of bed and go figure out what's happening or go answer an email because um, this doesn't happen all the time. But every now and then like interviewees get really nervous when they see their story written down. So like go talk somebody off a ledge maybe and <laughs> reassure them that um, this sounded fine and whatever it is, or it was okay to share X, Y, and Z. Yeah, there's a lot um, There's a lot to it. <laughs> yes, yeah, absolutely. And the, like you've mentioned, the pivots that we need to play as we learn more about uh, what the community needs or what the marketplace will withstand. It's, um, it's, it's a lot of learning constantly and a lot of commitment. I just, I think of those hours that, that uh, us entrepreneurial folk put into um, to strategizing and responding and just kind of sweating through unknowns. I relate with that so much. Um, when Women of Cincy started, it started on accident. Um, and I was 24 and I had just literally graduated um, from DAP. I went to UC. I didn't know you were so young when you started Women of Cincy. But yeah, I just turned 24 and I had no idea what we were doing, what any of this looked like. I had no idea how the city worked. I was always interested in storytelling and under and listening to people. I was invested in, um, I don't know, just like how people's lives work and what they're passionate about. But my background was like print layouts. <laughs> and then all of a sudden I'm like, what does it mean to be a good storyteller? And what makes a great story? And what are the ethics behind it? And, um, you know, obviously I wasn't in this alone by any means, but yeah, I just had no concept at the time what I was stepping into, which was great because I think it led to a lot of early successes because we were so naive. We didn't say no. We were just like, why not? Sure, we'll give it a try. Like, why don't we try X, Y, and Z? And we were just throwing, you know, whatever we could at the wall to see what would stick. And like from running processes, like I had never even, I've been an intern. I'd never had like PTO or anything. Like we always joke, we were building the plane on the way down. No, I think that we're like, you know, flying pretty steady, but uh, <laughs> yeah, the early days we were just like, sure, we'll, we'll try it. I love that lesson though, that to get out of our heads a little bit. That's why kids are so good at play and they're so good at being curious. Yeah. And, and taking creative risks. And it, we laugh, my, my husband and I laugh that our kids can't even walk a straight line. Like if they're moving from point A to point B, they will do it in the most flamboyant, flapping their bodies around kind of way. But, but there's something to be said for that. You know, they're just, they're, they're so kind of unaware of that voice in their head telling them to say no. And I think there's something beautiful about what's possible when, when we try to cultivate some of those behaviors inside of the innovation space, especially when we're trying to form something disruptive that's a startup or that's a lifestyle business or that's going to create community change. Oh, for sure. I talked about the three pillars, um, storytelling, community building, and uh, mentorship. We have a residency program and we serve college age students um, for an entire semester. They typically take us as a class, so it's about 15 credit hour class, uh, or three credit hour class, 15 hours a week in fields of journalism, communication. Um, and we've also had a design student, but that's why they are so great because I have now gotten to this point where we start brainstorming different things that we can do and I start saying, we don't have the money, we don't have the time, we don't have the capacity. And I'll start in my head shutting it down. And then I'm like, wait, 
I, I used to not be that way. So let me just like let them get all of this out and see what pieces of that can work, what pieces of it can we take out. So now I'm really in this role of facilitator and manager and like keeping us moving forward in as straight of a line as I can. <laughs> yes. Um, yes. Well, you know, everybody else gets to do the flapping around and <laughs> flip boy away how to get to point A to point B. Yes, I love it. I can so relate to that. Yes, yes. You know, as people who are listening to this podcast, they tend to be either startup founders or want to form a startup or they are in innovation and in research and development inside of uh, companies, whether that's mid-sized companies or or huge enterprises. Tell us about some of the storytelling and story sharing strategies that you think that they could learn from as they, you know, a lot of times um, those folks are, are telling the stories of a particular product or a technology, but they still need to be able to share the human impact and the experience that it creates. So tell us uh, about what you know about human storytelling based on what you've done with Women of Cincy. So I would say, first off, I think that for something to be powerful, it needs to be in the form of a story because, I mean, if you think about storytelling, it just transcends time and culture and race and political background and all the like stuff that we bring with us to the table, like storytelling just transcends all of it. Like, I don't think that people could say like, oh, this one culture isn't known for their storytelling, right? Like, that's what you do. That's how you like pass on um, who you are and all the life lessons that you learn. That's how you um, change the way that people think is by either them experiencing it firsthand or experiencing it secondhand through a story. And understanding um, what real empathy is and feeling real empathy. That's, that's how you change people's mindsets. So I think that um, that's why for us, storytelling is the answer. What does it look like? Um, we've just tried to be um, just very like, say it how it is, um, kind of like mentality. Like even in our brand language, the way that we talk is the way that we talk in a conversation because we are human centered. So we don't add a lot of fluff. I don't throw in really any like huge long words I wouldn't use if I'm not in a conversation. How we speak is how our brand operates. Um, Same thing with like even our intros to our stories. You know, we try not to get too flowery and like um, all over the place. We just try to say like, we met with so-and-so at this coffee shop. Here's a little bit of like place setting. And then we just dive into the story. And all of our stories, an important thing to note is that they're all um, Q&A. You know, I ask you a question, I write down your answer. Because for us, and it's been important from the very beginning, um, Women of Cincy started out of this idea that for us to be a stronger, better city, we need to see each other as people. Um, It happened in 2017. So life was a little crazy and there was a lot of divisiveness at the moment. Um, And we were like, well, we don't need to add our own bias onto these stories, our own opinion onto these stories, or to dissect people's words and rearrange them um, so that it fits this mold or this word count. We're just going to have a conversation and directly record it. So it's their words, not ours. Our interviewee, it is their story. And we shifted power, I guess, to the person. We're not the ones in power. We don't even pick the stories. The community does. So it's like, how can we just keep shifting that power back to um, our people? Because that's that's who we that's who we are. That's why we exist is to celebrate people um, and to create that empathy. That's been another big component of um, our storytelling strategy is to just tell it like it is, switch who is in control, and just try not to cut out the things that make life life but also do it in a way where we're celebrating people. Another thing that I always say, and this is just because I don't have a better term for it, but women of Cincy never and will never be poverty porn. We are never out to just tell a story from the angle of, oh, this bad thing happened to you. This bad thing is happening in our society. And then we end it. Like it's always from a point of, um, yes, this happened and it sucked, but also look how much strength you showed and look what happened here. And this is how we can solve it or these are resources that are out there. So there's always that like push and pull, um, I guess with power um, and just tapping into humanity. You know, there's a, there's a level of being able to disconnect your own ideologies and your own opinions and politics um, and perspectives on the world and your own life experiences, being able to sort of 
turn the volume down on them. I don't know that we can ever really switch them off completely, but turn the volume down and really listen to someone's story just for what it is, just for who they are and nod your head and listen and write it down. I think that's a really powerful empathy exercise. And there's something else that's super powerful too, because we talk about empathy a lot when it comes to innovation storytelling and how if your innovation story isn't connecting with someone on a personal level, if it if you're not empathizing with the users who, who are going to be the ones um, who are hopefully benefited by this big idea, then you're, you're, you're missing, you're missing out so much. And so a lot of the strategies for doing that, I, I love what you're, everything you just said, those are great strategies for making sure that your stories um, keep empathy in mind and you're turning down the volume on your own, your own voice and you're listening to the voices of others. And then in a lot of ways, learning how people talk, what they care about and, and continuing to ask them questions, deeper and deeper questions, so that when you go to present the innovation itself, maybe to internal leadership or to funders or potential investors, you're carrying those voices with you. And you're not only saying, I think this works for these reasons, Um, even investors too. um, There's a lot of conversation around how entrepreneurs need to make sure that their pitches connect on a relatable level to their investors. And I think that's important at the same time, it's important for investors to think from an empathetic point of view. There's a reason why we have a massive problem with the types of people who get venture capital and that being very limited to white men. And one of the reasons is because if investors are only thinking about what connects to them personally, and most investors are white men, they will choose products and solutions that serve white men as well. And so really thinking about the power that empathy can play and story sharing and storytelling can play as we look to not lose out on market opportunities that are meant for people who don't look like that traditional venture capital identity or the traditional startup founder identity as well. Yeah, I totally agree. And there's so much just um, strength and learning in having a life that looks different from somebody else's. So like, um, you know, like there is obviously like we hear it over and over, but it's true. Like there is power and strength and diversity you know, diversity of race and background and age um, and gender and all these things that people come to the table as themselves. They bring their whole selves to the table. It's not just one aspect of them. And we need to figure out, I think, as a city, as a society, as a country, you know, whatever you want to say, how do we celebrate all the things people are bringing to the table and listen to everybody's lived experiences? Because that's how we create better solutions. And that's a whole other tangent on itself um, about the way that we innovate. But I think that, you know, from us, what we've seen is the innovative people are the people who are living it. It's not the people who are in charge or the people who are controlling the purse strings. If you want to figure out how to solve a problem, go talk to somebody who lives that problem every single day. They're the ones who have the answers. And we see that in our storytelling constantly. Yes, um, yes. And they've got insights that people just don't even stop and think about. It's, it's super powerful. One of the other um, guests on this podcast is the founder of Include Health. And he started his entire organization um, when he was in college, actually. And it was while he was working out at the gym and he saw uh, someone in a wheelchair trying to use the weightlifting equipment and the struggles they were having to move from their wheelchair onto the equipment and to grab the handles where they were placed and grab the sort of the weight uh, little keys, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, and, and it just completely transformed everything that he, every way that he used to see the gym and how people use the gym and, and he created a startup from it. Uh, and it really, that, that level of empathy, that level of observation and being willing to put others stories uh, next to or in front of your own sometimes, I think is going to take us really, really far. There's something else that's really powerful about what you do at Women of Cincy that I think is relevant to the innovation community, and it's the power of reflection. There's a lot of conversation now in innovation about how to be comfortable with failure and talk more about failure and be transparent about successes, what worked and what didn't work. And 
I think that reflection is such a, a powerful way to go about making that kind of cultural change. And even if it starts at the level of sitting down and having your team members interview one another about the project and do it in a podcast style or do it in a blog article style, the way that Women of Cincy does, um, you know, or podcast the way that we, we do it on this one. And I think that that's a, a really powerful way to help change cultures. I, I'm thinking of my experience being an interviewee uh, with Women of Sensi. That hour was so valuable just in terms of getting my own thoughts out there and, and being able to connect on a deeper level with somebody who cared to listen to my story. Um, it, how about you as a guest on a podcast? Is it, what, are, what are your thoughts on, on the power of reflection to help us create, uh, create culture? Well, I think it's huge. Um, so we kind of have a joke that every year Women of Cincy like reinvents itself, but I'm not kidding. <laughs> so uh, we've probably had these like three like really big shifts um, and we're just over three years old now. Um, and it's because at the end of the year, we'll sit down and we'll talk through like, okay, that didn't work. <laughs> or okay, we need to do this better. Or, okay, like we see this need in our community that isn't being filled. Or okay, you know what? We see this need, but that's not our lane and we're not the ones to do it. So we are constantly just reimagining um, what we do and how we do it, what our content strategy is. I've got a phone call next week. It was supposed to be a big meeting. Um, internally, we're going to redo the way that our content schedule looks, which is huge for us because we are all about content because um, we just want to keep doing it better. We just keep learning new things about how to operate. Um, and we are... Uh, by the way, we are 100% like volunteer driven. I don't get paid. Um, like everybody's a volunteer on Women's and C's staff. Hopefully one day we have a small full-time staff because um, there's a lot of work to do. But um, so we are all volunteers coming together constantly. So we've got a lot of just like roles that are constantly changing just for the nature of volunteer work. So we've got new perspectives that are always coming to the table, which is actually a good thing. Um, and it forces us to stop and think about the way that we operate. Um, so reflection has been huge for us. Um, I think we've learned quite a few lessons, some of the biggest ones being that empathy is a muscle. So it's important for us to come out over and over and over with new stories and new ways to um, engage with people because empathy is a muscle. If you don't flex it, if you're not fully engaged, um, I mean, you will kind of lose it. So empathy is a muscle. We've got to keep coming nonstop. You know, we'll never run out of stories. We'll never run out of content. So that's a big piece of it. Um, we are for profit, by the way. We changed to a nonprofit, which was a huge jump for us. Yeah, yeah. But it was the right one um, for sure. And that came out of, you know, just knowing that we're stronger together and that there shouldn't be one person driving the ship. I was the CEO. Now I'm the executive director. So I've kind of, you know, handed over the reins um, to our community to take this and run with it. We've just, I don't know, there's, there's a ton of them. Um, I think another big one is it's okay not to have all the answers. And we're very upfront with that. Um, we always tell people in our like newsletters that we're learning. We talk about times that like maybe we said something and we were like, that's not how we should have phrased it. Or someone said something and we want to apologize. I wouldn't say apologize, but we want to change the way that we speak about a certain topic from here on out like we say all kinds of stuff publicly because i think that it's important to reflect and own up to when you do make a mistake and then not be afraid of that so for instance we <laughs> noticed um that so i mentioned that all of our interviewees for our feature stories are um, nomination driven so our community is telling us who to interview but we noticed that we ran a whole batch of just like 30 to 40 year old white women in a row Mm -hmm. And there was just like no diversity and it took us a minute and we saw that happening and coming down the pipeline. And so basically we just put out a letter to our community saying like, Hey, we're learning how to do this better. We're trying to put things in place to make sure that things like this don't happen again. We love all the stories that are coming out and we want to make sure we're telling everybody's story. So here's the three things you can do to help, you know, you can grab coffee with us and help us figure out how to better serve your community. You can nominate people on our site um, who have more diverse stories. You can invite us to an event and we'll just come connect with people that maybe don't know that we exist. Um, so we like just start putting out lists of ways that um, people could help us do this better. And so we do stuff like that all the time. 
I, I love what you said about empathy being a muscle that we need to practice. And that's probably the most powerful way that we could possibly end this conversation is just to remind everyone listening that empathy is a muscle and you need to practice it and you need to expose yourself to stories from people who look different from yourself in order to test your assumptions about what what will work and what won't. So Chelsea, I'm so grateful that you came on the podcast to talk about all of those things, empathy, storytelling, community building, and mentoring. It's all um, really just so important. And I know that all the work that you've created and that your community has, our community, I should say, um, has done to, to bring our stories to life has, has really been a lifeline to me and an encouragement to me and to so many others as we try to um, imagine new roles for our lives. So thank you so much for all of your work. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for listening. Appreciate it. Where can people find uh, more about you and Women of Cincy? The best place to find us is at womenofcincy.org. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn at Women of Cincy. Awesome. Thanks so much. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. Be sure to follow us on social media and add your voice to the conversation. You can find us at Untold Content.